get into that much in too much more detail, but I do want to describe some comparison between all of these methods. So the point method, which I described to you, is quite easy to produce. All we need is a coordinate of the data. But we have no concept whatsoever of spatial topology. To give you a, a super exaggerated example, suppose I have a specimen and the label says that it was collected in Africa. Great. Africa is different to georeference. All I need to do is draw a bounding box around all of Africa and find the center. And I do that. I don't know what the geographic center of Africa is, but it's somewhere west of here. And I suspect it's somewhere slightly north of here. I don't know that for sure. Not much more than this one. Anyway, it's a point. Now, if someone sees my georeference and it has no notion of spatial data quality, no uncertainty in years, and they look at it, it's a point. They may interpret that to be wherever that actual location is, and that that's where the specimen came from. Whereas the reality is it came from somewhere in Africa. So the point method captures nothing about the spatial data quality. Looks like the geographic center of Africa is near the border between Cameroon, Central African Republic, and the Republic of the Congo. So I might be slightly more here. And definitely west. Pretty much straight west. Okay. So we would be the point is that we would be ambiguous about how much we really knew there. Someone who saw these coordinates, including several decimal places, might think, well, this is exactly what came from. In fact, that isn't the case at all. The bounding box method is simple in terms of doing spatial queries. If you wanted to find out if something was inside a bounding box, you just need to look at the latitude and longitude limits and see if they're between. That's an easy query to do. You don't need a GIS. You can do it in Excel if you want. It. But it's a little more difficult to assess the data quality. You can look at the, board, the corners of that bounding box and get a sense of how far apart they are in degrees, but it doesn't tell you how far apart they are in kilometers. You see what I'm saying? So it's easy to know if you're inside the box, but it's not as easy to know how big that box is, at least intuitively. Easy enough to calculate, not easy to just query. The opposite then is true of the point radius method. It's quite easy to assess the quality because it's already in a measure in meters. So a radius of 1,000 meters is much more specific than a radius of 10,000 meters. We already have a single attribute that we can query on to see how specific the georeference is using that method. But it's a little bit harder, quite a bit harder actually, to know if you're inside the circle or not. So there are Pluses and minuses behind both of these two numbers. Then we have a shape method. We've already said that this is a way to get a quite accurate representation of a place. The problem is now we're getting into complexities of geometries. We're getting into the realm of requiring specialized software to be able to know if we're within, how big it is, etc. etc. So shape method, whereas it's the best, it's not the easiest, it's not even within the realm of possibility in most collections. It's not something that you can do in itself. Everything about there is possible to do in itself. Finally, the other thing about the shape method is that the probability is determined to be uniform everywhere inside the geometry. It's just the shape. It doesn't say what the probability is inside that shape. The difference then with the probability method is that it's non-uniform. The probabilities are different across the whole space where there's a non-zero probability of occurrence. But again, it's quite complicated. We're talking about rasters in geodic systems in order to be able to do any kind of analysis of this. So that's the rundown of comparison of the methods. In the 
the story of georeferencing and protocols that I'm going to describe, Mattis, Pertinent, and Ornis all distributed database networks now within the combined network called Vertnet. And we produced the methods that we're going to see for the um, creation of those networks because nothing existed before that in 2001 when we began. There were no methods for georeferencing. And what we adopted was a point radius method for the specific reasons that we could efficiently georeference, our results would uh, return information that could be assessed for its quality immediately, and that the results could go back into the databases of every single participant. There would be no obstacles to capturing the georeferences back at the source, which was always <coughs> the result. So, the idea here is that if you use this point radius method and a circle of the point radius would encompass all of the possibilities of where the location could be. So that's why we call it the maximum uncertainty. We tried to make sure that when we drew a circle, there's no possibility that the location is outside of it. The methodology formalizes a whole bunch of assumptions about how you should go about georeferencing. It formalizes the algorithms that should be used. It documents them, puts them in a standard. A book was written about this and published in the GDF network called the BioGeoMancer Guide to the Best Practices for Georeferencing. And as it turns out, the methods that were produced there are applicable not just to biodiversity, but to just about everything where a descriptive locality is given, and you want to try to make a locality that is not. I've already discussed the Darwin Board terms that are used. Now you can see, and you have some idea now of what the coordinate uncertainty in meters is for. It's a measure of spatial data specificity, and therefore it's a tool to assess the physical use. We talk a little bit about collaboration because in these networks uh, we work together and our funding sources gave money for the individual institutions involved to georeference their collections as well as to get the data online. But we had to do so in the most efficient way possible to make the best use of funds. The best way possible turned out to be collaborations, where all the participating institutions shared their collection data in one giant database before we began. And then we divided up the work geographically. So what it meant was that students in our university at Berkeley would georeference different parts of the world, such as South Africa, Chile, and California, where our institution had particular expertise. We had the maps, we had researchers who worked there, who knew the places intimately, and knew the problems that might be in georeferencing in those locations. Whereas students at another university, or another museum, collaborated together, in this case with 3D glasses, making all of these envious, Reference the places that they knew best, such as Madagascar, India, or Mongolia, because they had the maps for those places, they had the expertise for those places, and their institution might even have had the most specimens from those locations. But each of these groups georeferenced all the locations for the entire network. So, group one, you know, all of the locations for California, all of the locations for Chile and all the locations from South Africa for all the collections. And when we were done, we put it all back together and gave it back to the source institutions to put it in the databases. The reason we did it is that the, there was a sharing of resources and a sharing of expertise. As it turned out, it was also the creation of a social network, of people having the same problem and the same interests working in the same field. 
the scope of the comments of the problem within the MADIS network alone. This is the MADIS network information system, the first of the uh, three of the large scale geodesics and projects. There were 326,000 unique locations among the 1.4 million specimens in the network. We were able to georeference at a rate of 14 localities per hour on average, using the point radius method for which we developed the documentation, the tools, and so on. And in a period of three years, using about 40 different georeferencers, we were able to complete this task entirely. And the result is what we see in this map. So the georeference is a very large scale georeferencing project. It was global. We have records from all over the world, and we have georeferencers from 20 different institutions. It was a huge success. We completely achieved our goal. Because of that, we were able to use the same sort of arguments to get money to georeference the ornithological, ornithological collections on the Ornus sister um, network. Here, the scope of the problem is fairly similar. Again, 1.4 billion specimens, but this time, 267,000 locations. And you'll note, because Ornus came later and we learned some things in MADIS, that we were able to double the rate of georeferencing to almost 30 localities per hour. And so within a period of two years and 30 different georeferencers or so, we were able to complete this task. Now, the important thing was the increase in rate of localities per hour. I'll tell you about that in a minute. <clears throat> so, if we think about the problem on a global scale, there's a magic number of which no one can defend, but there are roughly 2.5 times 10 to the 9th records of biodiversity occurrences in collections around the world. So, if we assume, as the, as the case in the vertebrate networks, that there are roughly six records every unique locality, and then we georeference at the MANUS georeferencing rate of 14 localities per hour, that it will take us quite some time to georeference the world's biodiversity. Longer than I plan to do. Longer than all of us combined in this room have to then we put our, we put our lives end to end. So it's a big problem. We have to do better. Even if you look at the situation of the Ornus, which only double the locality per hour rate, we're still talking about more than 7,000 years to geographic the world of biodiversity. This is where automation comes into play. And it's where the increases in speed between Manus and Ornus occur. The two big contributions to Ornus that help speed it up are these. 